Welcome to Treasure Valley Podcast. I am Chuck. Today's episode is brought to you by Lower Gentry Studios. Here at Lower Gentry Studios, we create thought-provoking content with integrity and we enjoy every aspect because we are hedonists. You can go right now to www.lowergentrystudios.com to check out back episodes of this podcast, as well as several award-winning film productions that include a web series and two feature films. Yes. And all of them have won awards, officially. As of Saturday, yeah. our web series is now an award-winning web series. Yeah. Won the Vanguard Award and also the- uh, Guinea Award. The Guinea Award. At, at Twin Falls Sandwiches Film Festival. Yeah. It yeah. was fun. Yeah. Twin Falls Sandwiches Film Festival. Oof. Duh. That was not the words that I wanted to say right there. There's a lot of Fs. Yeah. Once Twin you Falls get, Sandwiches Film Festival. Once you get rolling with those Fs, it's hard to spit them out. Film Festival. For sure. All right. Why is today special? Today is special because- in 1895, on November 5th, George B. Selden patented the first automobile in the United States. Dang. Automobile. And so it was uh, Henry Ford that ended up, he, well, he started to sue the production companies. Okay. And uh, Henry Ford said that the automobile uh, industry would have been better off if that dude was never born. Wow. Oh. Because he was he was tying up all the production in court and withholding uh, progress in the vehicle industry. Wow. Okay. So the the rich people always win, even if you have a patent. Makes sense. Which kind of leads into the chat we were going to have today. Yeah. Today we actually, it was spurred by two weeks ago, we endorsed Andrew Yang as president and we yes. got a lot, a lot of feedback in the comments. And one of the comments was from Rhythm and Acoustics who said, we don't know what libertarian and or socialism in and we were just throwing out those terms willy-nilly and we didn't know what we were talking about so today we're well that was implied that was inferred that we didn't know what, what we were yeah, talking didn't, about you didn't actually so, sorry man sorry if you're but uh you said that you, we throw them around without defining them and so i we want to make sure that we clarify the difference between libertarianism and as socialism. we as we understand it as yes as we understand it and obviously when we talk about libertarianism versus socialism um, if you have any thoughts or ways that were wrong, please put them in the comments below. But we yeah. wanted to kind of sort out today whether Andrew Yang technically defines himself, or actually, or is defined in terms of his policies as a libertarianism, or libertarian, ugh, wow, I'm not speaking very eloquently today. That's okay. A libertarian or a socialist, or whether those distinctions even really matter, because I feel like he would have an opinion about this because he says it all the time. But either way, it's a this or that question. So let's get to the bottom so of this or that. Yes, let's get to the bottom of this or that. And first we have to find the tune. There it is. That is a good song. Yes, it is. So Very good song. I was trying to think of a way to work in the word this, but... This makes me happy. Yeah, for sure. All right. So first, we have um, we have kind of these two things that have been put in the media and have been put in writing as these polar opposite issues. On one side, we have we have on the right side we have libertarianism, right? Yes. On the left side, we have socialism. Correct. Right? Let's first define the terms, and we're going to be very specific in our definitions for the purposes of this discussion because we don't want people, YouTube people, to be angry with us. Yes. Okay. So which one should we start with? Which one, which one do we want to start with? Well. I think we should start by saying when we quote libertarianism versus socialism or libertarian versus socialist, I'm just kind of using it in the current zeitgeist. Yeah. And that's how I think of it when I'm using it quickly as a knee jerk, which to me, libertarianism is minimal government. Socialism is redistribution of wealth. Yes. And that's how I think of it. Mm -hmm. And I don't necessarily think of socialism as being a redistribution of wealth, uh, by the state, it could be by any organization that could be a socialist organization in my mind. Okay, I guess it's just it's just. Oh wait, wait, wait! Really? So you're not you're not thinking of like socialism as being a, a governments using the coercive power of the state to redistribute wealth or to even take over certain industries? What do you? Oh, I'm just trying to say like a, as far as a group. So it's to me, to my mind, it just works as redistribution of wealth. So therefore, if you're going into government espousing that than it is that's using the government as that okay. medium 
right? Okay. Does that so? But anyway, I guess we all were always talking about, or we had been talking about the government policy. So that's was when I was using it. I'm pretty sure I used the phrase. I'm sure you used the phrase in the last podcast. Yes. And pre- previous two podcasts. That's what I think of when I. But the but when you look into the history of libertarianism and socialism, they both have a crux um, where they meet. Yeah. In the past, mm-hmm. in the 1600s, with John Locke. Yeah. And he. Um, essentially he was an individualist yeah and he but that that was that was rooted right prior to the renaissance or in the renaissance era ish Mm -hmm. yeah am i wrong about that yeah like when he was am i right or wrong what when he was doing his philosophizing his philosophizing yeah john John Locke. Locke. that would have been post uh that would have been post uh uh renaissance but yeah yeah okay so right after the renaissance right in there right before all the big revolutions kicked off but i don't think he was alive for those he no. would have been dead for that time. But um, a lot of his political philosophies were taken in the left-leaning way. So he was about individualism and against the uh, the autocracy of the time in the form of feudalist empire or feudalist yeah, and monarchies government. and stuff. Yeah, right? Yes. Yeah. So he was just trying to tear that apart, that there are, everybody's on equal ground. And so it separated off after him into... Um, anarchist socialism where everybody gets a piece of it and then later on it started to develop into or in our country it was more of hands-off policy laissez-faire economics Mm -hmm. and those are the two different strains yeah and then you had mentioned libertarianism when people talk about that in europe they think of anarchists um, yeah, yeah, especially in Spain, bec- uh, bec- they think of you as an anarcho anarcho syndicalist, right? Syndicalism, right? Um, and then you actually, when you when you read other people like uh, uh, Noam Chomsky, he considers himself a libertarianism yes. in the European tradition. And I guess the difference being is that there's kind of a there's a left libertarianism and then there's a right libertarian right or right libertarianism and the left libertarianism would be we want to organize our society in these small groups, these small like you know, anarchist units, right? But within those units, we want to outlaw certain things, right? Like private property, wage labor, and um, basically the the agreements in them would be that everybody would be communal and sharing everything. Whereas the right-leaning libertarianism would say that everything is defined by private property, that you're defined by your individual identity and not in this group identity within your small commune or within your small village, right? Yeah. The interesting thing that I always think about when I think about the the difference between, especially in the European predi- uh, tradition of where it actually came from, is is uh, is the argument between uh, Karl Marx, who everybody knows, he's the guy that you know did the Marxist crap, right? And yes. then you have uh, and then you have this guy called Oh, Mc- he was the initial Marxist. Yeah, yeah, he was like the oh, first one. Oh, got it. Yeah, and then there was this guy called. Was there a Bob Social? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> but then there was this guy, uh, this guy, uh, this Russian revolutionary called Mikhail, Mik- Mikhail, I'm sorry if I'm butchering the name, Mikhail Bakunin. I'm pretty sure that's how you pronounce it, right? Okay. Um, and they had, uh, the Mikhail Bakunin and Karl Marx, they both did a lot of writing. I would say Karl Marx is probably uh, the m- more intellectual of the one, of the two. Um, he had more um, concrete ideas about how the economy works because a lot of our a lot of the terms that we throw around now came from Karl Marx. You know, means of production, modes of production, all that other stuff. That those those terms didn't exist before Karl Marx. So obviously, Karl Marx like footprint on history is way greater. Mm-hmm. Uh, but anyway, they had this big battle. They were both part of this uh, international workers. Um, this international workers party that was all across Western Europe. And their whole idea was that they were trying to instill um, revolution in all of these different countries, right? They really, they wanted to be a part of, or, you know, they wanted to instill revolution in Paris after the fall of the, uh, the, the, the original French revolution, right? Yeah. And they wanted to do it in Poland against the Prussians. Yeah. They wanted to do it against Prussians and they wanted to do it in Russia too. And that's what Mikhail Bakunin was about. But Mikhail Bakunin and Karl Marx, when you read both of them, um, they both agree on the end point, right? They both agree on this idea that society needs to be organized in these small little groups, right? Yeah. And they actually, they all agree that, um, they all agree that, you know, when those small groups get there, there should be no wage labor. There should be no private property. It should all be communal property. But the ways in which they get there are completely different. And that's where they disagreed to the point where Marx kicked Mikhail Bakunin out of and his and his people out of um, out of the of the group that they're part of, the international group that they were part of. Uh, and then so the ways that they differed were Marx believed that you need to take over the infrastructure of 
the current governments of the current monarchies of the current aristocracy or the current gentry, right? You take over that infrastructure and then you use it for a while and then you slowly break it down using politics and all this other stuff. And then you slowly break it down into these small, these small communes, right? Whereas Mikhail Bakunin was all about, uh, we need to tear it down right away, right? Mm -hmm. Like just hardcore revolution, just go knock it all down. We should be using no existing infrastructure, no existing departments, no existing um, whatever, right? Whatever government facilities is in place, we should not be using them, right? Yeah. And then we should tear it all down. And then they were, and then basically what happened was Marx became very, very popular, right? In places like over the over the decades, it became very, very popular. His idea became very popular in places like Russia, right? And then Mikhail Bakunin became very popular in places like Spain. Yeah. Right. And then so these differences of revolutionary ideas kind of, I think they inform our American idea of what socialism is and what, what libertarianism. It's just on the libertarianism and we kind of added like a little American twist where it's just like, yeah, we're, we, want our, we want our society to be formed in these little small units, these little small kind of commune-like commune -like groups, right? But we want it all to be about private property. Yes, all about the individual, which is very, well. It's, it's a very American idea. Right? Yeah, yeah, and it's and it's also the economic aspect as well. And yeah. that was John Locke that originally was for minimal amount of of uh, government interference, and and he he's the one, I believe he's the one that came up with uh, the idea of the supply and demand, and how there is a natural state. Yeah, to things and how price can be interpreted. And oh, man, I think he's the one too that that talked about. And I hope I'm not wrong on this. Correct me on YouTube if I'm missing the the quotes or the ideas from John Locke, and it's somebody else. But um, that the waste ethics uh, of of that time in feudalism was that there were a lot of there was a lot of wasted land and wasted food based mm -hmm. on the system that was in place. So he was okay with hoarding cash, but he was not okay with hoarding land. And he felt like the the natural uh, economic system would be able to take care of that if there if there weren't that in place where the hierarchy entitled people to manage this land. Mm -hmm. So just kind of open it up. Yeah. So interesting. I, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. So he so he was he was in favor of of currency because he didn't feel like that was that was uh, morally bankrupt to hoard that because it wasn't wasting any actual economic production that required the sustenance of life. Oh, okay. Which, I mean, that can be argued, but we were actually going to talk about values a little bit. Yeah. Because we, we had talked about well, we, ideology this, yeah. and what that, uh, what that looks like in the knee-jerk reaction to a lot of people. And right now we live in this political climate where everything is in sound bites. Mm -hmm. And so you have to be very careful about the position you make because if like i say if i i say that i'm libertarian in a majority of my political beliefs people would might assume that i have all sorts of these other ancillary beliefs that they've had sound bites piped into their eardrums and their eyeball holes from all over all all sorts of media yeah yeah because uh, i think sources. i think getting all of a sudden getting like an ideological marker on you as a person yes. all of a sudden subscribes you to like a checklist of things that you may or may not believe which is i guess part of the problem of maybe like even endorsing like a certain like ideology right i am a libertarian and then people are like well so so i shouldn't have a driver's license and they're like well maybe the government should maybe do driver's licenses Right. Yeah, and, and then all of a sudden it's like, well, you're not really libertarian because libertarians believe that there are no government rules ever, and it's like, uh, maybe not. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. and so we we were talking about how it's so important to have a a hierarchy of of personal values. Yeah, that that you feel are important. And what were the, you were going to talk about the Jesuits a little bit? Yeah, for sure. And then I think we should probably get back to the original point because what are we yeah. trying to figure out right now? Um, Andrew Yang is yeah, he we... socialist because of his policy of redistributing wealth, or is he libertarian because he is in favor in a lot of ways of minimizing government force? Yes, with exactly. that redistribution. Yeah, because the redistribution actually gives people the option to spend the money as they choose, mm -hmm. and then he actually frames, especially off of the freedom dividend or the universal basic income, he frames it as not really, it's not really like an entitlement program. It's almost like, well, it's your money anyway. You know, it's almost like that's why he says that it's a dividend. It's like you pay into this corporation, which is the United States of America, and you get back a dividend as if you were investing in a stock company. Yes. You know? So, you know, that's, I, I would say that he's both 
<laughs> yes. Okay. So we should probably get back to to uh, Jesuits, huh? Yes. Let's do that yeah. because this is kind of how we ca- we can come to that conclusion. Not only because of the socialism and the libertarianism here in this country versus you know the anarchists in in uh, Europe, which it's really interesting. King, kingdom of was it a kingdom of Aragon at the time? Yeah. Barcelona was anarchist. Yeah. During the uh, during the Spanish Civil War. Spanish Civil War. That's where George Orwell was actually shot. He was shot by the USSR. Because the USSR found out that the uh, that the port in Barcelona, which was a very important port in the Mediterranean, was uh, turning all anarchists, and they had gotten rid of private property and money and all the stuff. And they're like, "Whoa, we have a lot of crap shipping in and out of that port." So they actually sent uh, the, their military to attack the other side, not the not the Franco side. They attacked the people that were fighting Franco that they that themselves were supposed to be attacking. So George Orwell actually left like outside of madrid he left the front lines like fighting the uh the fascists that were being supported by adolf hitler and then he went back and then he got shot through the neck by the ussr (laughs) and then he had to sneak out of the country anyway yeah it was kind of a mess over there you get money involved people like that stuff yeah exactly so the us yeah (laughs) yeah that's actually that that was actually part of his uh george elwell's part of his uh um, that 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 fed into the ideas of a lot of his books. That's why you know in his famous books like 1984 and and Animal Farm, they're just you know Animal Farm especially is just a thinly veiled like go screw yourself USSR. And then 1984 is obviously a lot of like um, Soviet ideas that have gone like crazy. You know. Yeah. 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 It, it, was... it speaks more to like the USSR than it actually does maybe to the future, despite all of our our talking about Orwellian. You know. Yeah. But the Animal Farm is a really interesting quick read because it's just. It's the history of the USSR as portrayed by pigs. <laughs> yes, exactly. And other animals, and other cute farm animals. Yeah, it was pretty awesome. <laughs> anyway, let's go. We're 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 going off course here. So okay. what do we what do so, we got? Jesuits. So, so oh yes, let's Jesuits. Talk, let's talk about the fact that it's so important to have a hierarchy of values when you are deciding to engage in politics. I personally believe, but if you want to have a knee jerk reaction to everything. That's your business. If you think every single issue carries equal weight and importance for you, yeah. then that's, I guess, a hundred percent fine, and you have every right to espouse that. But I would recommend making a hierarchy of values and finding out where those issues lie to decide whether or not you feel that it's worth your time and energy to be upset about them, or that you need to push that agenda on others. Yeah, yeah, because I think it's, uh, and this kind of goes into the Jesuit stuff, and it kind of ties back into Andrew Yang, because you can kind of see Andrew Yang kind of picks and chooses um, where he's, what it, whatever is classic socialism in this in this American socialism or, or democratic socialism, kind of like yeah. the Bernie Sanders or the maybe before him Ralph Nader approach, right? He's for single-payer health insurance, right? Yeah. And then um, he's for... Uh, I mean, as a program, right? And then, yeah. and then he's for like certain poverty programs. He's talked about that, um, and then, and then also he has kind of a little libertarian leaning when he talks about public colleges, right? Yes. And and then he also and public education and public education in general. He's big uh, time. He's been uh, he's been talking about voucher systems and stuff like that, or at least at least saying that voucher systems play a role in in the education in a country. Yeah. Um, so basically he's not, it's harder to pin him down, which makes it, makes it harder for media to, to like him. But and either way, it, though, it makes I think, it easy for them to just pick a certain point and then attack him as though he's on the opposite end. So yeah, exactly. that their listeners hate him. Exactly. Because so that's he goes what the on media Fox does News. Well. Yeah. If he goes on Fox News, although it's not going to happen, but as he goes along, he's going to go on Fox News and they're going to be like, well, you're a socialist, you're an evil communist social, blah, 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 blah. And mm-hmm. he's going to go on CNN and they're going to be like, oh my God, you, you want everybody to just die in the streets and nobody's going to have public education anymore. And then he's going to get kind of caught in the middle in that band because people like ideology. But whenever I see his positions and how he kind of picks and chooses, I always think of Jesuits and Jesuits is called casuistry. Um, so casuistry kind of espouses that that principles and ideologies um, don't they don't do well when you're confronting new problems, right? Um, when you were talking about the libertarian the the, the messages of libertarianism um, or American libertarians, yeah. when you're reading their the their, policy standpoint from seventy four. Yeah, from nineteen seventy four, they kept on talking about you know it's all all government should do is just about um is just about personal personal rights, right? Yes, freedom your freedom to have your personal rights is their number one. Yeah, concern. so so basically, the ideology says that the only time the government should be involved is just for your own individual rights, right? But in nineteen seventy four, they weren't able to really talk about something like data rights. That's Correct. not something they could they could have even predicted, right? Yeah. So all of a sudden you have this ideology that just says the government is only involved in this one thing, right? 
And then all of a sudden we, we are opened up to this whole new world. Right. Yeah. And then, so where do you land on it? So in, in casuist or casu casuistry, excuse me, this is what Jesuits priests and I'm not, I'm not Catholic. I feel like I have to throw that out there. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But what they say is that when you're confronted with a new problem, you find basically you find the either end of a spectrum. Right. Yeah. So if you're like, if you're, if you're approaching like a case for, let's say killing a kid, right? Okay. Like you're, you're like, you're on the jury and you're approaching killing a kid. Right. Yeah. So you say straight murder is always wrong. Mm -hmm. always get the death penalty, always go life in prison, whatever, right? Yes. Abortion is okay in the current laws, right? Yes. All right? He killed a kid that had gotten out of the womb. Is it more like murder or more like abortion? Yeah, more like murder. It's more like murder, so you need to punish him, right? Yeah. And then so then and then so basically you find the the cases and where it li lies on the spectrum. That one's really easy, right? Yeah. So when I was thinking about like in well, terms the abortion thing is definitely not an easy argument because that leads <laughs> into a whole can of worms on that. Yeah, maybe one. I shouldn't use that example, but I'm just saying in the present laws, <laughs> present in the present laws, laws current system, given yeah. regardless of how you feel yeah. about that issue, which I'm gonna say right now, I have. It's, it should be up to women whatever they want to do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I'm gonna say I'm gonna stick with that because I, there's no chance of me ever getting pregnant unless they figure out that CRISPR thing, how to change <laughs> an entire chromosome and not just a strand of DNA. Yeah. And I don't even know what would start to happen if they figured that out. That'd yeah. Be crazy transition. <laughs> but anyway, so anyway, so yeah. that, that basically that's the spectrum though. They assign something that yeah. everybody that like that is currently legal and some or something that's currently illegal and then something that's currently legal. Yes. Right. And then they say, okay, what is this case? What is this one closest to? Yeah. And that's the only way that you can really like identify new information. And you have to be kind of a pragmatist to do that because yes. ideology doesn't give you the doesn't give you the tools necessary to to know whether it's, it should be regulated or not. Yes. So when I think of like personal data. Right. Correct. Like what is the what, what is the what is the casuist or what is the casuist way that we need to like look at it. Right. So personal data would be on one end. Maybe you'd have like a credit card. Like if somebody ki like steals your credit card number and buys a bunch of stuff. Right. Yeah, steals your username and password and then yeah. uses it to find information or order stuff online or whatever. Yes. Yeah. So that's what everybody theft. would say. That's theft. And that's everybody theft. would say that's that's absolutely 100% theft, right? Yeah, okay. correct. And okay. I mean, we we've, we've even have court cases of people uh stealing stealing films and music. Yeah. Uh, yeah. they've, they've lightened up on that since Netflix yeah. got so cheap but same thing it's a bunch of ones and zeros if you steal it then yeah then it's wrong coding. and then I think I think if you were to take a poll majority of people would say okay that's a that's a good law mm. right yeah yeah probably right like so if you if you get your credit card number stolen stolen you shouldn't be accountable you for shouldn't be purchase. accountable for it that should be the the government should find the person they should throw them in jail make find them whatever mm -hmm. the bank should should yeah. not charge you for whatever, right? So everybody says that that's probably good law. And then on the other side of the spectrum, and it took me a long time to think of something like this, right? But it's all about your personal, basically your personal identity, your personal property that isn't necessarily like something physical, right? Yeah. So I guess on the other side of the spectrum, you could say cameras on public property, right? Yeah. So cameras on public property. You enter into like a, a, a public area, right? Mm -hmm. And you allow yourself your photos to be taken because you know that nobody's profiting off of them and you know that you're willingly entering into a public space, right? Yeah. So those are the two ends of the spectrum. And then I guess you need to like find out where does personal data fall on, on that? Mm -hmm. When I say personal data, I mean like uh, the tracking on your phone, Google, like profiting yeah. off of your Google searches and selling your data to get more ad ad money like yeah. which one is it more like, like yeah what, what we and we th and the thing is is it's nuanced yeah exactly i can think of a lot of other examples where it's really unclear yeah. where that should fall yeah exactly uh, if you if we're filming something yeah and we're in a private location yeah and we film somebody in the audience yeah and we don't get their permission and we sell that production to the venue and then they sell it yeah then we could be held liable if that person sees it and wants to collect what they feel they owe. Exactly. And they were in a private facility mm -hmm. and they they paid the ticket price to go see the band or whatever and we accidentally filmed them or we intentionally filmed them or whatever yeah. the case may be. But they are most likely going to win a court case yeah. For taking their likeness. Yeah, for sure. And that's and then, a digital that's a digital version of them. Yeah, exactly. And I think part of it is I think part of the reason that we that, that the personal data thing is going so big is that they would win the court case because somebody was profiting off of it. 
Yeah. You, you know what I'm saying? Exactly. And we have if it's entire... about just general surveillance or in a public sphere mm-hmm. that nobody's making money off of, I think most people would be like, okay, well, whatever. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, but, the, but the thing is, should people or can people, there isn't an industry in the tech uh, world that's kind of gone, well, I'm that I'm aware of. It would be really hard for you to exist online without being tracked. It would be a lot of work, I would just about imagine. Oh, to, to be not a, tracked? To, to have a cell phone and not have your information go everywhere. If somebody wants to comment and they know how to do it, I would be really curious on yeah. how to exist without having all that information tracked Yeah, automatically, like where you are online, what your previous web browsing history yeah. is. I'm sure they have web browsers that you can download. I bet there's places that you can pay to have storage on yeah. the cloud. Yeah, I mean, I, I know but, that, I know that uh, certain celebrities pay companies to disappear online uh elon musk dumps his phone like every month or something like that oh really yeah he gets a new phone i don't know how often it is it's like every month or two and the security people around him said yeah that's a good idea <laughs> just keep on getting you a should new probably phone. just keep getting a new phone every so often dang. but uh we that have must whole... be really expensive for elon i feel really bad for him dang poor guy <laughs> well, that's probably just like one more thing he has to do on his work schedule. He's, <laughs> I'm trying to, I'm trying to land this rocket. I'm trying to land this rocket. I gotta go get a new phone later. <laughs> I'm sure he has people. Who yeah, they phone. probably pick that up for him. Hopefully, they're trustworthy, right? But yeah. yeah, that's so the the importance of having that thought process and having a nuanced conversation about the changes that are happening all over the place right now and how that affects everybody in society. It's so important. Yeah. Versus any type of knee jerk reaction. Yeah. This is good. This is bad. But it starts yeah, in the I'm a ideology. Socialist. Yeah. I'm a socialist. I'm mm. an, I, I'm a libertarian. Oh, mm. no. You're a socialist. So I don't like you. Oh, you're a libertarian. I don't like you. I don't like. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think. I Which think I guess. Uh, what was what was the guy who commented? Uh, was uh, rhythm and acoustics. Rhythm and acoustics. Maybe he was right with his his comment about us just throwing the terms around because we don't want to we don't want to make it seem like we're taking shortcuts. Yeah, exactly. But at the same time, understand that we don't take shortcuts when it comes to thinking about these issues because i think we've had so many of these discussions um yeah on so many different occasions and yeah and usually it's after a beer or two it, <laughs> it loosens the lips and we have no qualms about <laughs> saying pejorative yeah. statements about each other's opinions yeah for sure <laughs> but i don't know i guess I, the more that we talk about it like especially in terms of andrew yang it's it, you said he's both and i just i, I think that the terms are so I guess it would be nebulous, right? Yeah. There's no center to them. They they're just they they they're general terms that that characterize large sections of people with a wide variety of different beliefs and a wide variety of different policy positions that they want the government to do or not do. Yeah. Um. So I think that uh, I think that yeah I think it's it's good basically to to not throw those things around because I think what he had what he had taken exception to was that we had said. Um, that socialism always leads to bureaucracy, and we just kind of said that as an off-the-cuff thing. Oh yeah, and then and then that was probably not a good thing to say. No, it all, it, it tends to. I would say it tends to. Yeah. There's a pretty strong correlation towards towards bureaucracy and and redistribution of wealth because you have to have a system in place. Well, no, I always think about it, and yeah, I always think about it in terms of if you socialize a a, a specific, I guess a specific, um, excuse me. Uh, if you socialize a specific um, market industry right? or a specific industry, woof, yeah. thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Boom. It's a long day. Anyway, so uh, if you socialize a specific industry or a specific service that you're trying to provide, right? If it's a part of the free, if it was a part of the free market, right? The people are voting with their dollar, right? Yeah. So basically they're not going to you providing that service. You're going to, they're going to somebody, somebody else, right? But if it's all socialized and there's no competition within that market, then the only way to make sure that the, that the that the socialized industry is actually behaving the way it's supposed to is to go through the legal system and then so so if you're going through the legal system or legislature or the legislature whatever so that means that industry needs to have a lot a lot of paperwork to prove that that they're doing a good job because Mm -hmm. the other way that you know in the free market area the only they would already know that they weren't doing their job because they wouldn't have the money from the Mm -hmm. customers that they were getting I know that was kind of general. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so basically you're trying to always prove, so then you end up having a lot of paperwork, and then you end up having like people yeah. assigned to that paperwork to prove that they're doing the job, right? Yes, so the the checks and balances become much slower because because once it, once something is, I think of, of school systems as one example, but there's also something that's socialized 
I would say in this country through the insurance companies is is medicine. Yeah, because because the this the group the group redistribution of uh, medical care yeah. through the insurance companies is terribly inefficient. Yeah, and and part of that, I mean, that still goes through the le- the the legislature and the judicial system as well, as far as the checks and balances. But 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 the market, you don't know what you're paying, and so it's that's socialized. Um, but yeah, so the checks and balances, you have to go through a system yeah, so of bureaucracy. But in no, order you're to you're what making you a you're making a connection between private insurance companies and mm. then the government. So basically, you're saying that private insurance companies is akin to socialization socialization of medicine because. Because you're paying a private insurance company, and then you're not actually paying a direct doctor. Is that yeah. correct? It's a it's a voluntary it's a voluntary form of socialism. So basically, Commu- communism as in a communal. Okay, so it's just basically right? you're you're throwing your money into a pot, and then you're not knowing what 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 the actual service that you're getting provided is. Or yeah, how much, exactly. How, what the cost is of the pr- mm-hmm. of, of the service. I mean, it's a gamble essentially. I mean, that's what insurance is. Yeah, a gamble. But okay. but anyway. It, but anyway, so I guess I know I see what you're saying, and that's socialism. I guess we, we're going off on another tangent. I do see that as as having to go through bureaucratic process to get a change, rather than being able to quit, make a quick decision and just not take part in it. Yeah, exactly. And, and the, the ebbs and flows are a lot slower if you have to if you have a, a board of directors. The more people you get in charge of something, the less efficient that it that it ends up working in most cases. I would argue. Yeah. So basically. Uh... Rhythm and acoustics. I feel like this is just this whole podcast has just been for you, dude. Nice, or do that, <laughs> or do that. I don't know. I, I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, that's that's what we meant by uh, socialism leads to mm. more bureaucracy. Which I mean, I guess I, it doesn't really necessarily have to. I mean, mm. if you were to change the, if you were to change something, and if you were to reduce, you know, the amount of paperwork that's required, it was kind of funny when I was looking at a thing today. There's every time you get a fax from, um, um from us from social from social insurance uh sorry social security insurance yeah i got one of those things today and i looked at it and then like on the second page it says the 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 paperwork reduction act and it's like a separate <laughs> two pages explaining how they like reduce the paperwork in this fax <laughs> <laughs> yes that sounds like a government enterprise to me for sure. Oh anyway. my gosh. Anyway, so where do we land on Andrew Yang? I guess we landed um, at a while I like ago. him. I wanted to say I I prefer him as a candidate because he does have that system. It seems like he has a nuanced way at looking at each issue and he weighs the the positives and the negatives of a certain direction. And I think that is a sign of a good leader. Yeah. I, before him, I think my most uh the the candidate I've ever been most excited about was Ron Paul. Who's on the other end of the special specul- spectrum because he's very right winged, but he was had a very nuanced opinion because he understood the way that the Federal Reserve work. He understood how that affected um, the economy as a whole and how that uh, hurt free market uh, massively due to the fact that there was a monopoly on on currency. Yeah, and he was so eloquent. Yes, he was. Well, not quite as much as Andrew Yang, <laughs> but pretty eloquent. Yeah, I didn't, yeah, I was never a big fan of Ron Paul. That's okay. I thought he was all right. <laughs> we don't he, need to argue about it. Right he was now. a wild and crazy and kooky guy. Anyway, um, are we are we done? Yeah, anyway, should we do it? We should do a joke from a hat. Yeah, let's do a joke okay. from a hat. Oh, if I can find it, dang. Oh, there it is. Come on, DJ. It. Take a joke from a hat when you read it. I'll bet that you make someone laugh. It's a joke from a hat. All right. This week I found a non-branded hat, and it's a wool cap. It's dry clean only. So, as Mitch Hedberg said, that means it's dirty. <laughs> you should just end there. No, you no, got to do the okay. worst joke. Okay. I just quoted Mitch Hedberg, which is obviously funny. So now we got to do one that is more up to the level of this podcast. Okay. What's bigger than a ten-gallon hat? An elephant. You were trying not to laugh on that one. No. I could tell. No, I mean. I could tell you were holding it back. Yeah, okay. Well, thank you all for tuning in this week to Treasure Valley Podcast. This episode has been brought to you by Lower Gentry Studios. Here at Lower Gentry Studios, we create thought-provoking content with integrity, and we enjoy every aspect because we're hedonists. You can go to our website, lowergentrystudios.com, to catch the back episodes of this podcast, as well as our other award-winning content. Thanks for tuning in this week. That one was all over the place.